Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and today we're going to do something, I always say this, Donnie, do something a little different. Today we're going to focus on something I think is kind of an important issue, but at the same time it's a really cool thing to think about, and that is essentially what is the role of a Dungeon Master in any awesome Dungeons & Dragons game, no matter what edition you're playing. In fact, any pen and paper role-playing game, what are you supposed to be doing? So let's talk about that. Now, I come to the, your table with a little bit different background than your average kind of Joe dude, right? So a lot of people are players. They've been playing the game forever. They play 5th edition, 4th edition, 3.5, Pathfinder, Traveler, whatever you play. 1st edition, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter to me. I, as long as you are playing something and having fun, that is totally cool with me. I was a young kid in the neighborhood who started playing DD around the time uh, that first first edition came out with Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So these old classic modules I've been running on the YouTube channel are what I grew up with as a kid at 13 years old, right? Way back over 40 years ago. I was an architect for 10 years. So as an architect, you're meeting with clients, you're designing buildings, you're doing freehand sketches. They look a lot better than this. And uh, you're uh, creating a real space for real people. And you're learning how to make other people's dreams come alive. In fact, I used to do uh, beautiful second home uh, beach homes for people that were well-to-do, well-off lawyers and senators and stuff, and they want to have a beautiful beach house. And that's a lot of fun because I'm designing and creating a home even I wouldn't get to live in for someone else. So you're creating and designing for other people. You're designing like the Florida State University baseball stadium for other people. You're designing the Gulf Coast Community College building for other people. You're designing elementary schools in Killarne, in Tallahassee, Florida, or Ocala, Florida, whatever. So that's the architect job. The only thing that's really changed from then to now is we used to draw everything uh, manual, and nowadays everyone uses a computer. So I played D&D &D as a kid in my teens, then I transitioned into being a young architect. I did it for about 10 years, but my whole life has been a gamer. Uh, squad leader, Panzer leader, Atari 2600, early computer games where the operating disc is on one five and a quarter inch floppy and the actual games and the other like Wizardry 1 from Surtech. So I transitioned into the video game industry in about 25 years ago, around 1995. And I was one of the original guys working on Epic at Epic on Unreal and Unreal Tournament. And since then I've gone to work on Crisis Games. I got a chance to work on Doom and a bunch of other junk. And I've done all kinds of game design work, work around the world. Now, I also a very, very hardcore MMO player. I love RPGs. Don't play as much pen and paper tabletop anymore because everyone has lives and it's complicated and it's hard to get people together to play. And I'm not a big fan of playing with people that are random over the internet. I like to play people I, I like as people who I know are smart and want to play the game with the same level of respect and, and joy and, and um, they're looking for the same kind of fun, like local gaming shop type people, right? Of all ages, doesn't matter. So with all that in mind, you have to kind of understand, if you're a super young person, I'm gonna sound like an out-of-date old dude, right? <laughs> but if you're an old guy or an old girl, you may, yeah, a guy has a lot of sense. He's like trying to bridge the gap here. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to mitigate something that I see as a problem. And this is the word, my. Uh, you know, if, you've, if you're a writer, you've written a book, you understand how important it is to develop the storyline and you have complete control of everything. For, in fact, I wrote a book, right? And this isn't to, to pitch the book, but I spent about 11 years writing this 444 page historical novel. It's a big swashbuckling sword fighting tale in the year 1515 when France invades Italy, which at that time was just a bunch of city states in Milan. And it was the very first battle in uh, military history where artillery was used against heavy cavalry, um, meaning the Swiss pike. So the main character in this story called Iron Roll West Rush, you can get it at Amazon, is a fencing grandmaster so I have a heroic character right just like when you play D&D &D. or you're a Conan the Barbarian fan or you're like Dritz Duerden or you're like Elric of Melibone you have this heroic character who's caught up in this massive big battle and over the tale of this whole story of all these historical characters happening in the end we'll see what happens right so I wrote this book I wrote this book because not only did I want to get better at writing I want to have absolute complete control of everything that happened in the story and present it to someone who's never heard the story before so they could have the story be kind of teased out page by page to not know what what's going to happen next, kind of like watching a television show, a big series. So that was an awesome exercise because I've been doing video games for 25 years. And when you're doing video games and you're designing levels or designing the game and the combat and the systems, all that kind of stuff, you're kind of doing a little bit like you do in D&D. In a video game, you say, hey, listen, we're going to have this, you know, frost giant level and there's going to be 
frozen caves with bones and you're going to have big combat situations with big stone pillars and big caverns and all this kind of business. You might fight a dragon, you might fight yetis, might fight winter wolves. You know, the game, the video game is going to control all the to hit rolls for you. The player is usually just one player or if it cooperatively is going to determine what actions and powers and abilities they use against the enemies that have actions and powers too. But in video games, things are super happy, happy, joy, joy, and you're supposed to win, which is one of the big disappointing things about the video game industry in general is the fact that most of the games are pretty damn easy. Um, it didn't used to be that way. If you're an EverQuest 1 player or, or Ultimate Online player or Dark Age of Camelot player, you know it wasn't that way back then. But things have changed and things are much more amusement park these days and there's nothing wrong with that. So how does this relate back to the word my? So I am a member of a number of Facebook groups. I recently actually left a number of Facebook groups as well. And it doesn't matter because I'm not some superstar or anything. And the reason why I got fed up with some of these Facebook groups is these, uh, this perspective on the role of the Dungeon Master. And I would try to say what I think, and I got to a point like, wow, I'm being kind of narky with some of these people. That's not cool. Let's be more upbeat and cool about this. Let's evangelize the idea without being excessively negative. So when a player signs up to play D&D in your D&D game, they're looking for an opportunity to be a hero. They're looking for a dramatic battle, kind of like this little situation you have here where, you know, I'm in the front row and I, this is Mercedes and this is Zolaris in the front row. These are our characters from our uh, classic DM show and they are taking on this uh, frost giant king face to face using all their abilities, high AC, low AC in first edition, low AC armors, two-handed weapons. You've got an assassin in the back hide in shadows. You've got the druid and the uh, illusionist trying to help out. You've got a cleric. You've got a monk trying to figure out how to position, maybe trying to pull off a stun. You know, some people say you can't do that. So you have these heroic situations. This is like the dramatic Frank Frazetta cover art that's the big fantasy for the person that wants to play um, a D&D game. That's what they're looking for. They're, work, they're looking for opportunities to be incredibly, incredibly heroic. And the reason why they want you is because you're the person that's going to magically reveal what could possibly happen page by page, but you don't tell them what happens. The players show you. So one of the rules of writing is show, don't tell, right? Don't describe a scene that says uh, exactly how the character feels show us the character feeling something and then we'll figure it out in our head because we're human beings. So they always say in writing, show, don't tell, right? Don't use passive voice, show, don't tell. In D&D, it's a different situation. I'll describe the environment to you because you don't have a three-dimensional re uh, representation of it, like a level. In a computer game, we can show you brilliant levels, but everything kind of decays after that. In a computer game, it's not really all that intriguing. The NPCs are giving you quests. It's very spoon-fed. It's not very challenging. And, and the games are designed to help you win. But in D&D, you could really die. You know, in D&D, you could really screw up. In fact, in D&D, you have this massive six-plus player cooperative environment, and you have a DM who's a human being using monsters and making making positional flanking moves and deciding that these guys are going to flank around here and jump on the monk from beside. This guy's going to come up here and try to cut off the assassin. The illusionist might try to sidestep over here and do something. The cleric realizes he needs to back out. The druid wants to go over here. You have this moment to moment, you know, millisecond decision making stretched out over a melee round, whether you use a segment like I do or a melee round. And then you have all kinds of things can happen. Like, you know, three winter wolves come piling into the room in the back and start blasting the back of the group. That would never happen in a computer game. We would never do that. It would be so unfair. People would cry. So in D&D, &D, you have these great war game style tactical battles with the best AI in the world. Some of the most imaginative locations you could ever possibly come up with. But the DM, you don't ever want to say, they killed my frost giant. They killed my BBEG, big bad evil guy. They killed my red dragon. My party are a bunch of murder hobos, and they're killing all the key characters in my story, right? In my story, my story, and they're ruining my plot. So I hate to sound like Chael Sonnen, who's an awesome guy, I love him, he just retired recently. But that's wrong. That's not what it's all about. It's not about that. You are the DM. You are the AI. You are, you are the narrative designer. You're the production designer. You design the scene, the sets, the characters, the monsters and aliens. You're Giger, right? You design the locations in all the Star Wars films. You designed the lightsabers. You're what a workshop that did all the stuff in the Lord of the Rings. You designed the props. You designed the locations. You make the monsters like Smog and Lord of the Rings come alive with personality. You control what they're going to do tactically during the battle. You allow the players to respond to those conditions in any way that they want. 
You don't fudge rolls because you don't want what they decided to do to happen. If they outsmart and defeat your monsters, guess what? You've got 55 billion more monsters you can give them, and they don't even know what you have in the next room. You can change what's happening in the next room because you realize that you have a dynamic difficulty system. Now we hear, you could say, you know what? These guys are having way too much fun. Let me just put some Yetis into the situation in the next room. I just happen to have, what do you have? You got a book that has Yetis in it. Pull the book out. These are the same hit dice. Start throwing in more interesting creatures that act in different ways to keep the difficulty in the balance. Don't run around complaining about, they killed my frost giant in one melee round. They killed the frost giant commander in one melee round. So, what does that mean? That means these kids are really good heroes. That means they think really well. They have great gear. They have great damage output. Guess what you have at your disposal to figure all that out? A copy of their character sheets. You have a copy of their character sheets. You know what the hit tables are going to be. You can take a look and say, you know, if I really get hard pressed here, if we get really, really hard pressed, really hard pressed, let's just take a look at the fighter, okay? We've got Mercedes Dominici, negative, uh, negative two AC. She's not gonna get hit much. If you're playing in a campaign that's got a bunch of 10 hit dice monsters in it, just go take a look at the 10 hit dice monster, this one right here, table two, attack matrix for monsters. If, you're, if they're trying to hit the uh, armor class of negative two and they're eight to 10 hit dice, they're gonna need a 12, a 13, a 12, an 11, or 14 to hit them. So you may say to yourself, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, how can you adjust this? You, can, you can't take away the player's armor class, what you can do is you can boost the hit dice number of the monsters. You can give them a magical sword that gives them a bonus to hit. Maybe you want these guys to hit on an eight out of 20. You hit them hit her more often. Look at this girl's hit points. These are heroic characters. There's another whole issue. And I use max hit points for the monsters and max hit points to players the house rule, right? You as a DM have things you can do to tweak the numbers without cheating to keep the challenge level on par with how good the party is and how powerful the party is. That fighter is the bomb. That is probably the most powerful, lawful, neutral, level 12 fighter you've ever seen in your life. Even though she has a plus two, plus four of Zweihander, which is a two-handed sword, she's wearing plus four plate mail. That is epic. It was intended to be epic. The reason why it was intended to be epic is because I wanted the battles in the whole campaign to be amazing. On average, a level 12 fighter rolling an average five, okay, with maybe a 15 constitution, which doesn't even give you, what does it give you, like one hit point per level? Okay, she got 60 hit points. A frost giant at that level probably has between 40 and 56 hit points. It's almost like they're equal. The only thing that prevents it from being equal is the players usually have really much lower armor class and the monsters have a little higher armor class. So the monsters have a tougher time hitting you and you have an easy time hitting them. So the odds are you can kill one, two, three, before the cleric needs to step in and start throwing in heals. But in first edition, the healing for the cleric is very monumental and it's also a random number generator. So let's all get back to the whole thing I was saying earlier about my. Stop being possessive with your enemies. What's supposed to happen is determined by the kids playing. Everything is for them. The building is for someone that's gonna live in a building. The book is for someone to buy it and read it. It's not for me, it's for them. You make the computer game for millions of people around the world. You make Unreal and Unreal Tournament and Doom and all these other damn games. They're for some else to play them and have fun. And you know what? And some people say, I don't like that game. It's not cool. Oh, I, I really like Final Fantasy or I love Black Desert Online, but I'm not a really big fan of Neverwinter. Well, I like Neverwinter and I like Black Desert Online and I love EverQuest 1 and I love EverQuest 2, but I never liked Star Wars Galaxy. But I have friends who love Star Wars Galaxy, have so many cool memories. It doesn't matter as long as they're having fun. As a game designer, fun is the number one rule. Everything must be oriented around the players. Let's just make sure we get that really clear here. You are a dungeon master, okay? Your goal, I have to the kid in the Stranger Things, can we go play D&D now? What you need to do is approach your game like a set of tools. Here's your, here's your party of players. You need to know ahead of time, you need to know what their character sheets say. What are their character sheets? You need to understand what the module you're doing, or even if it's your own hand-baked uh, hand campaign, you need to understand what kind of enemies are they going to face. You need to understand how well will those enemies be able to hit key players in the, in the, uh, in the player party, right? Let's just do it this way. One frost giant versus the monk 
is a completely different scenario of one Frost Giant versus Mercedes. okay? First of all, the Monk doesn't have Jack for hit points in first edition. Really, 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 really low. So let's just take a look at that real quick. Let's go down to Elephant AC. Where is she? There she is. Her AC is zero. She was talking about bumping the mic. Her AC is zero. These guys are going to hit her pretty easily, especially if they're 10 hit dice, right? So you got like a 10 hit dice monster trying to hit ACs. They only need 10. 50% of the time, they're going to hit her. And when they hit her, guess what's going to happen? She's going to get splattered. She has 40 hit points. She has the same hit points as Obscura does, the, the Illusionist. In first edition, it's nasty. Low hit point, high AC care player characters are at a huge disadvantage. They shouldn't be up in the front line off tanking crap. The fighters are very, very powerful in first edition. Let's get you a little bit better view of that because we've got this other camera turned off. We need to turn that back on. The fighters have a great view of what's going on. These two fighters here, let's get these other guys out of the way. We just said the illusionist, the low hit point, four hit dice characters, they have a tough time battling things. What you need to do as a DM is stop thinking of, I spent all this time creating my frost giant king and the party killed my frost giant king or my big bad evil guy too quickly. I need to cheat the dice roll so my players feel challenged. What you need to do instead is say, you don't need to replace it with yet another guy who's too hard to defeat. What you need, let them mow through the guy. Every time the players are in a combat situation, you as a DM are getting a better idea of what they can handle and what they can't handle. This party of players, but with one person not playing one weekend, one person couldn't be there, change may change the entire dynamic tactically of the whole fight of what's going to happen there's no illusionist playing this weekend that person's sick they have a little kid that's sick they have to go to work whatever's going on they have a paper due in college they just don't feel like playing the moment the illusionist is out of the game things can be very different that weekend An illusionist requires a lot of creativity and a lot of thinking and a lot of spell determination based on your imagination just having two frontline fighters melee training their way through everything with a cleric can probably do almost all the content in every single D&D module ever until they start getting wiped out by a whole person and being nuked to death. So having a druid in there, that druid, is that a nuker druid? Is that a melee druid? Is that a shapeshifter druid? The personality of all these different players and how they play have a huge impact on what the difficulty level needs to be. Your focus as a DM is to create a magnificent world, well described, well worked out, you're like a poker player with all the cards. You need at a moment's notice to be able to pull things out of your pack to ramp up the difficulty and ramp it back down. You don't need to be cheating dice rolls. You don't need to make be making up weird rules on the spot. In fact, I read a Facebook post the other day. Here's what it said, right? This guy said um, something along the lines. I'm, I'm going to change it around so the guy who actually wrote it doesn't feel like I'm making fun of him because I'm not making fun of him. But he said that the party killed my halfling necromancer who was going to resurrect his wife what should I do? Something along those lines, right? There's more complexities to it, and I'm full sure what he was trying to do in his campaign with this halfling necromancer. I don't know what edition he was playing. I've never seen a halfling necromancer, but hey, it's possible. It means D&D. &D. You can do whatever you want, right? So I couldn't understand in my mind why the person was referring it to my halfling necromancer. It was like, in my mind, this is like a the, the bad guy, the big giants, you know, this one, for, they're, they're, the, they're, the, they're the antagonist. They're going to die. They should be hard to kill. It should be dramatic when you're trying to kill them. When they get killed, I should be excited because my players really, really had to think to do it. I shouldn't be upset. Why do I care? They're going to go to the next dungeon and do some more stuff. They're going to get some cool loot. They're going to become even more powerful. That's a challenge for me to make sure the next combat encounter is even more intriguing. In fact, I even learn how to do things like in EverQuest 1. Okay, I hate to refer to this old game. In EverQuest 1, if you didn't stop a runner, right, you have guys that would run. Someone would get wounded and run. What they're going to do, they're social. They would call it social. They're going to run, and they're going to pull the whole level. So you're going to have this train of stuff, Fippy Dark Paul style, come rolling into the room with help, 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 and all these mobs are going to swarm the room. Believe me, first edition AD&D, &D, without a cleric casting Entangle and everyone being surrounded, people are going to die. And in first edition, you don't want a lot of people dying all the time. You don't want them having to go back to town and do a resurrection. I'm not a big fan of the whole roll up a new character called Billy 2. You know, I don't believe in that. I think the players should fear death ultimately and always be in a situation where they can try to get themselves out of it and play defensively. So going back to the original issue at hand, as a dungeon master, you are the creator of... The, the sandbox of the world. You're creating the map, the level, the drama. You might have a story in mind, but keep it loose. Keep it an outline. Don't be hung up if exactly what on page 173 sounds like revenge to me, not normal seafaring thievery, doesn't really, really happen. It's not a book. 
It's not a Netflix series. It's a module with loose information. And if you go look at some of the first edition modules, you'll see things like, in this room are seven frost giant guards. They don't talk about the level. I've done a whole series of videos that talk about how to take a really boring level like that and make it really cool because that's the level designer inside of me. So it's okay to feel ownership over what you've created. I think that's great. It's called pride. But when you deliver the owner, it's like great to be a card dealer and, and, and a blackjack at the blackjack table in Las Vegas. You don't own the cards. You're just playing by the house rules. You use the rules. You're supposed to do what you're supposed to do at certain times of the cards, and you watch what happens, and it's exciting. There's a lot of people in this world that play blackjack dealers. As the DM, you're the world designer, the level designer. You're the master narrative person. You're the person in charge of all the game mechanics. You're going to make judgment calls like a judge in a courtroom about whether you will allow the druid to defensively back away with her shield and keep her back turned as this guy chases her off screen. Are you going to allow the illusionist to pull up and cast a spell really, really quickly when you know deep down inside that by the time she gets done casting this guy's around the corner and she has no line of sight. You want to enable heroism. You don't want to alter reality for the rules to get broken to ensure the heroism happens on your terms. Let the players determine what happens. So enable the players to have fun. Be a champion of the world and they'll keep coming back because they, you will get better at balancing difficulty and balancing story and creating interesting locations. And you end up tailoring everything around what these players really, really want to have in their game. Stop using the word my, start thinking about our. It's the world, create the world. You want them to say, this is the best DM I've ever played with. This guy's stuff is fantastic. It's so fun. In fact, when the illusionist drops off and goes to summer camp or the, someone's dad comes in and plays and picks up and you have two druids in a party, it doesn't matter because you're such a great DM, you can adapt to things. It's like the great MMA fighter who by the end of the first round has got the opponent completely figured out. And in fact, at this very moment, there's an MMA fight on right now, so I'm going to stop making a video and go watch that. You guys have fun and we'll talk to you later. See you, dude.